If you're talking about it, we're talking about it. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Uh, welcome back to the program. Now, as uh, we mentioned before the break, uh, we're going to be pivoting over to the Middle East. I'm joined uh, on the line right now with uh, our correspondent, our de facto European correspondent. Of course, he's a contributor at 21stCenturyWire.com. Follow him on X and Twitter at LFC News Media. Freddie Ponton's joining us on the line right now. Freddie, how are you? I'm very good, Patrick. Good to be on the show. Good to be with you today. It's great to be with you as well, Freddie. And uh, first of all, uh, we want to get uh, your uh, your help to explain exactly what happened uh, in the French Assembly. What an incredible scene. We're going to play the <laughs> clip, and this is in France. So after we listen to this clip and see this incredible scene, uh, we want you to help us uh, translate what happened and explain exactly who is doing what um, here and why this is significant. Let's go ahead and roll this clip. So, first of all, um, it looks like she is, or they've sanctioned uh, the French MP who unfurled a Palestinian flag. So it looks like this is about Palestinian statehood, if I'm not mistaken, the recognition of Palestine. Uh, if they're going to be following uh, some of their other European uh, members like Spain and Norway, for instance, recognizing Palestinian state. And then an angry outburst uh, from what looks like uh, one of the leaders there in the assembly basically shouting uh, at the others to basically put that flag away. And it looks like they've sanctioned uh, one of the members there, uh, Sebastian uh, Delogu. Uh, explain to us what went down here, Freddie. Well, I, I think this is the, the, the results of a, a buildup uh, and the frustration, if you will, uh, the, uh, the left parties and the... Uh, France Insoumise has uh, experienced in the National Assembly that asked some very, uh, very clear and very straightforward questions to the Prime Minister, to Gabriel Attal, asking him to basically take a position. So I think at this stage, especially uh, following the, uh, the the event and the tragedies, as well as the horrors that took place uh, uh, in Rafa. Uh, on Sunday, uh, I think uh, the political party wanted to to get some kind of a commitment from the government and wanted them to take a very strong position, not only at the United Nations Security Council, but also within the National Assembly, sending a very clear message to the constituents that, uh, you know, this was unacceptable. And more importantly, this will be sanctioned uh, by France, something that unfortunately did not happen. Uh, Gabriel Attal literally clearly basically provided a, a political, a politician uh, answers, which definitely kind of upset uh, uh, many people on the bench. And then uh, following uh, on that day, what happened is the member of the parliament, Sébastien Diloglu, uh, from France Insoumise, you know, someone that has been uh, groomed and been working alongside uh, Mélenchon, uh, uh, waved the Palestinian flag in the hemicycle to literally draw attention to the, uh, uh, the Rafa massacre literally on Sunday. So that was, uh, it's a rare event, of course, and that created a bit of chaos. And uh, uh, very quickly, we saw the uh, pro-Israeli uh, presidents of the assembly uh, National Assembly, Yael Brun Pive, which you can hear in, in this video, coming basically very strong onto the member of the parliament, telling him that it's absolutely unacceptable for him to do that. And basically that uh, she's already sending and issuing threats to him that uh, there's going to be some consequences to his actions. And then the, uh, eventually the MP is going to be removed from the National Assembly uh, and he's going to say, basically, uh, as he's leaving, you can hear him, it's not on the video, but he says that uh, I waved the flag within the largest French institution because at the time we are speaking, children are being massacred with French 
weapons. So that's a very interesting comment on his part. We know that uh, uh, Minister of Defense and other uh, members of, uh, of the uh, French administration from the executive branch have been asked about, you know, providing more information about uh, what France is doing about stopping, signing on, aiding Israel in his war efforts. And we do know there's a lot of documents and uh, we, I think you can gather a sense that the French is trying to hide a little bit that they are still supplying basically Israel uh, with, uh, uh, of course, arms and weapons uh, that are lethal. So it's a bit of a, a problem. It's been an ongoing debate. And I think that's the result of, of, of all this frustration and this lack of transparency from Macron's government, but also the support uh, that is provided by uh, the far right with Marine Le Pen or the right or uh, Ma Macron's dissidents. It's really basically uh, a free quarter of the assembly literally uh, uh, on board with Israel. And that's what we are seeing at the moment. So eventually, later on that day, Patrick, the, a vote actually took place in the National Assembly and the uh, member of the parliament was temporarily excluded from the Nas uh, uh, National Assembly for a period of 15 days, which is really ch the maximum sanction the Nas National Assembly can uh, uh, impose uh, uh, on, a, on a member of the parliament. So uh, it was approved, as I said, by the majority the right and the extreme right political parties of France. Uh, it was really a shamble. It was a shame to see that really nobody uh, allow uh, basically that free speech, that expression, which is traditional in France. We like we like to express our political views. We like to debate about it, and we like to make strong statements. That's part of who France is. And if you look at past debate in the historical part of France and debate in the National Assembly, I've seen far worse than that. So yes, it's yeah. uh, it's, it's a tough one, but. Uh, yeah, great for him to do it. He's a very brave man. So, uh, Miss Gabrielle uh, kicking up a fuss, so she don't like, doesn't like a Palestinian flag being shown there or a flag, but she herself wears an Israeli flag on her lapel uh, with the French and Israeli flag, the double flag. So that's okay for yeah. assembly leaders to wear an Israeli flag on their person all the time. But if anybody dares to unfurl a Palestinian flag or some kind of a card or placard or something, then you get the maximum sanction. That's right. You can do things when you're the president of the National Assembly. You're you basically control whatever happens in there. So you you have some kind of entitlement there. And she indeed wear this badge, and uh, it's uh, it's appalling, as I say. But uh, they, these people are not hiding. You know, uh, Yael Brun Pives traveled actually to meet Netanyahu, and she traveled to Israel literally. Uh, uh, just days after the October the 7th, she was all there to see what she can do and how she could help Israel. And she's been a, a very strong advocate for Israel. So, as you know, you know France has a, has a strong uh, uh, Jewish lobby and uh, they've been very, very more than active. They are present in many sphere uh, in our government, but also in, 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 in corporate France as well. So they're extremely strong. Uh, they have a strong representations and uh, uh, they get the they get the job done when it's needed, and 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 the, and the government is happy to take a knee. So that that has been like this for the last past twenty years. And again, the uh, anti-Semitic card has been basically uh, uh, you know placard on all the walls of the National Assembly. And if you ever you know speak in in wrong terms about Israel, you'll definitely be labeled as, as an anti-Semitic person, which is pretty much a, a hand of your career politically in France if you do so. So. It's a, it's a sad uh, it's a sad uh, political spectrum. It is a sad it's a sad scene, and a brave person like that should have been recognized. Mélenchon actually made a, a remark about him. Uh, he was an interview about the incident, and he said that uh, uh, this member of the parliament punishment should be considered as a decoration, like kind of a military decorations, if you will. And he made a very statement. He said, "We've seen too much here, too much from the friends of the genocide in the National Assembly." Never punished, always encouraged. That's as strong okay. as he gets, but that's Mélenchon style. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's it's good. At least uh, they're seeing some opposition there uh, that's vocal on this issue. Now, let's go over to uh, Israel right now to Palestine. The situation in Rafa, uh, the sum of all fears uh, looks like it's unfolding. Uh, Freddie, violent attacks on refugees by the Israeli military. So the full force of a U.S.-backed military uh, unleashing some of the most powerful weapons in the world on civilians, 
uh, who are basically lit living in tents. So we'll, we'll cut to some of those clips. I want to show some of those in a moment. Now, when challenged about this in the United States, uh, John Kirby, White House spokesperson, uh, the arrogance still unbelievable. They're literally dropping all sort of, you know, dropping all sort of pretenses of uh, caring about human life here. We got a clip from John Kirby. Uh, this is literally fresh out of the uh, White House. Want to get your reaction to this, Freddie. Let's go ahead and roll it. The red line that the president laid out. As I said, we don't want to see a major ground operation. We haven't seen that at this point. How many more charred corpses does he have to see before the president considers a change of policy? We don't want to see a single more innocent life taken. And I kind of take a little offense at the question. No civilian casualties is the right number of civilian casualties. And this is not something that we've turned a blind eye to, nor has it been something we've ignored or neglected to raise with our Israeli counterparts, including, Ed, this weekend as a result of this particular strike. Now, they're investigating it, so let's let them investigate it and see what they come up with. But the president doesn't have, like, a personal limit to this? The president has been very clear and very direct about what our expectations are for Israeli operations in Rafah specifically, but in Gaza writ large. We don't support, we won't support a major ground operation in Rafah. Uh, and we've, again, been very consistent on that. And the president said uh, that should that occur, then it might make him have to make different decisions in terms of support. We haven't seen that happen at this and point. Why not have him come out and say that himself? The president has been speaking to leaders throughout the region on a regular basis. He has been addressing you guys in various fora. Uh, you've got plenty of opportunities to talk to the president, including, I might add, in a press conference last week. Totally, totally bonkers, Freddie. The, just to be clear, Freddie, the official Israel position on this latest strike is it was a grave mistake. They claimed that Hamas was hiding in tents. Now, Freddie, listen, uh, uh, call me a military amateur pundit, but it, it, that's not where Hamas militants are going to be hiding in tents with the <laughs> civilians and refugees, are they? Are they not going to be 50 meters underground uh, in subterranean bunkers? But that's just me. I'm not a professional. I'm not a military expert. Freddie, your comments. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, Kirby is a pathological liar, as simple as that. I mean, the simple question is that uh, we had that no response from Israel as far as the uh, planning for the invasion. So there's no real strategy. There's no real plan. We can clearly see how the population has been displaced internally, move further center uh, of Gaza uh, towards Deir al Bala uh, and the beaches there. So it's really, really uh, appalling to to hear him making comments about you know what Biden has decided and that they, they might just change their their views about this. Uh, potential offensive. What they forget to tell the people is that uh, uh, just got the information about an hour ago that uh, the IDF now controls 100% of the border areas of Egypt, which is known as the Philadelphia Corridor. And uh, this is supposed to be a demilitarized uh, zone under the 1979 uh, Egypt-Israeli uh, peace treaty agreement. So uh, I think we, we're going to see that statement probably within the next hour or two. But uh, as I said, one million internally displaced civilians finding refuge in the Al-Bala. They're living in tent camps. This is really uh, made out of nothing. Uh, nothing was prepared for them. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, 10 miles along the Gaza coast, basically filling the beach, spilling into the streets, uh, onto uh, uh, empty lots. Uh, and uh, they're just simply trying to to survive. You know, you, we can see, you know, videos of families basically digging uh, trenches uh, to, to try to get a bit of a toilet, some kind of privacy. Uh, fathers going out there trying to find some water and food. And then, of course, the, the children go out there into the buildings, anywhere they can in the trash to find some cardboard, some wood, so that the mother can eventually cook a meal. The, the situation is desperate. And I think the best way to... Um, uh, to, to kind of uh, portray how desperate the situation is, is to look at the numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. And uh, according to the latest figure from the UN humanitarian office on Friday, which they released, they say that only 53 trucks 
basically are, are making it into uh, Gaza. And that is since the May the 6th. Now, the real number, if you want to starve off starvation in Gaza, you will need approximately 600 trucks to die. So that's just give you an idea on how very little makes it to the strip. Forget about northern Gaza, they pretty much get nothing at all. Uh, I mean, if you look at the amount of people that, that died since uh, last week announcement from the ICG that they, Israel had to stop immediately, basically, their uh, offensive plan uh, on, on Rafa, you get 83 people that have died uh, in Rafa alone. So that's clearly really an indication that Israel is not going to stop. Uh, the United States... And Kirby is going to tell us the same story they've been telling us for seven months. Nothing is going to change. The weapon and the bombs are going to still aren't going to make it to to uh, to to Israel, and they're still going to be bombing uh, the hell out of the the Palestinian populations until eventually, you know, uh, uh, the United Nations Security Council can you know can get his fill of murder and and death, if you will, because. This is absolutely unacceptable. It's outrageous. I, I, there's no word to explain how the international community and myself are extremely upset by what we are saying. And of course, the lack of response is even more disgusting. And uh, what about the uh, recent incident over the last couple of days, Freddie? Egyptian soldiers uh, being fired on, injured, and even one killed, I believe. We don't know the, I don't have the exact numbers but uh, shot by the IDF. So a, a live fire exchange between Egypt and Israel. So uh, what what's going to happen here? I mean, uh, if that's not an abrogation of the Camp David peace accords, as you said, it's supposed to be a demilitarized zone, Freddie. Uh, yep. Are they playing with fire here? Yeah, they're playing with fires, and it's quite also indicative that amongst the, uh, the Egyptian uh, army, a lot of people are extremely upset with what's going on and what is allowed to happen in, in Rafa and, and the crossing. And I think that within the army, there's definitely some people that sees that as a provocation from Israel. So, uh, of course, what we're going to get in the mainstream media is that Israel is going to conduct an investigation and then the Egyptians' authorities are going to conduct an investigation. But none of them are going to tell you the truth because on one side, Israel doesn't want you know to to make it a big deal about it, and on the other side, the Egyptians are very worried that to release or perhaps to inform the public that there might be some kind of trouble within the countries. And we talked about it on you know every month. We, we keep on talking about that pressure, that domestic pressures that the countries, especially like uh, Egypt and and Saudi Arabia and Turkey, that all these countries are under tremendous pre uh, uh, pressure from their constituents because people are seeing what we are seeing here in the West and they can clearly see that uh, the whole thing is a shite show. It's a real bad adventure. It's a bad journey that is allowed to happen. And I think at this stage, they feel embarrassed to be the neighbors, to be Arab countries and not be able to, to basically do something about it. So this is going to show more and more as we speak and as this conflict unfolds. Uh, so nobody's going to talk about what happened at the border because nobody, at least both countries, has no interest in 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 in, in, in kind of you know talking more about the topic. They don't want to escalate for obvious reasons because it's it's just keep... not going it's not going to be good for either side. But it Both does show you the chutzpah of Israel that they they believe they can get away with pretty much anything. I mean, let, let's I want to show you this this is a clip from uh Israel's bombing of the uh tent city uh in Rafa. I mean, unbelievable scene. Let's go ahead and roll this clip, uh Freddie. <laughs> I mean, unbelievable. That's from last weekend, uh, Freddie, or uh, just earlier last week. And I mean, the, if if these types of scenes would normally provoke some kind of an emergency meeting at the U.N. Security Council, uh, the U.S. would be wanting NATO to do a humanitarian intervention. 
They're saying, oh, you can't use the military against civilians. They've been doing it repeatedly for like the last seven months. And just when they were warned, don't cross that red line in Rafah, Israel's going ahead and, and done it. So there's there's absolutely no restraint at all. I think at this point, Freddie, we can say there's nothing restraining um, Israel. It's going to do whatever it wants. Yeah, there's no breaks. I mean, this is an open bar, and it's been like this for the last past seven months. And uh, we we saw some of the uh, you know uh, some of the explanation as uh, of what we are currently saying very well articulated by the uh, Algerian ambassador. Uh, to the United Nations today. There was a UN Security Council meeting today. So a lot of special coordinators for the peace process in the Middle East were invited basically uh, to discuss about the increasing violence uh, reported in Rafa uh, and, and of course uh, calling for the resumptions of uh, ceasefire talks. So uh, Algeria is uh, very interesting because first of all, they, they put together now and they've circulated a, a text uh, in view of draft resolutions, which uh, uh, could be a, a acceptable for uh, every uh, permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. And that is really about, you know, at this stage, you know, uh, invoking uh, the ICG, uh, invoking basically this, uh, uh, these proceedings, which basically uh, asking uh, officially uh, 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 the, the Netanyahu government to stop basically military operation in Rafa because it's now really endangering the civilian population to a degree that it's putting the group, which is the Palestinian civilian, this one million people at risk, not at, only at risk of starvation, but at risk of dying because if they can do it in Rafa, which was declared officially by the Israeli government as a safe zone and, and, and tell them that, oh, we can move you back out there against all international uh, humanitarian law regulations, you know, which clearly state that you have to prepare the ground in order to move a large amount. Now, I don't think people really understand what a one million people displaced population uh, camp looks like. I've saw one in Sudan during the Darfur crisis, and I can tell you, it's, it's just literally, uh, it will pose you, it will pose you for a moment so that you can grasp, you know, how huge, how big this is. And this was well organized. I mean, United Nations, there was no firing at the camps. This was properly managed, almost as like a, a little town, a little city or a big city, but something that really will, will stick with me for a very long time. So having this in a, such a small place uh, on the beach, on the streets, you know, of, of Gaza, in Deir al-Bala, which normal population is about 10, 15,000 people, it's just... I just can't even grasp how they, this is manageable. So I, I don't think we're going to see, unfortunately, any uh, any changes on, on that size. I think the Algerian ambassador uh, has made some interesting comments during uh, his speech at the uh, United Nations uh, Security Council uh, meeting, reminding the UNSC, the resolution 2334, which basically clearly state that the settlements are illegal and, of course, constitute a flagrant violation of international law. He spoke a lot about the West, Gaza, and what's happening, the, the settlement, these illegal settlements. And today we have 800,000 uh, illegal Israeli settlers uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the West Bank. And I think that's really, really important as far as being able to, to really grasp, you know, how, how you know, repetitive and a relentless, you know, uh, a hunt for lands, you know, and taking someone else's lands, taking someone's livelihood. And as he said clearly, as one of his conclusions, it was that the occupation is the cause of the suffering for the Palestinian, and the suffering will stop when the occupation is over. So that's a very clear message that uh, we are not in the vacuum of October the 7th, but in a much bigger picture, and the occupation is the root of the Palestinian suffering. Uh, and we'll get more comment on this. I'm with Freddie Ponton, independent journalist and researcher based in Europe. Uh, we're talking about the situation in Gaza. Also, uh, the United States and some of their officials have weighed in on this as well. And Freddie, uh, former governor of South Carolina, who threw her hat in the ring for the uh, Republican nomination, not too successful. Nobody really voted for her. Nikki Haley, but she does like her wars. She is a war hawk. She is absolutely shoulder to shoulder with Israel. 
Israel. She flew over to Israel, in fact, and did a signing ceremony, writing her name on some bombs that ended up being dropped and slaughtering civilians in Gaza. Her name is Nikki Haley. Uh, we've got a still image up here, a couple of uh, images here of what she was up to, uh, signing her name onto bombs uh, in Gaza. We'll throw that up on screen, and we'll do a zoom in on that. There she is, signing. Uh, she's saying, "Finish them." Fin uh, actually, we've got we've got a close up of that. Let's throw that other image. Look, finish them. She's talking about Hamas. Apparently, uh, uh, America loves Israel always. Nikki Haley, and uh, it's not about finishing Hamas because they haven't done it and they're not going to do it. But they're sure doing a good job of finishing babies, women children and innocent civilians. So my question to you, Freddie, is, is somebody who does that publicly fit for public office? Because she is currently uh, auditioning for either a vice president slot with Donald Trump or a cabinet position. I mean, you can't really walk back scenes like this, Freddie. Go ahead. No, this is part of a, a, a political communication plan. You know, this is not. This has nothing to do with whether she believes or not. It's uh, it's attracting basically uh, and targeting a, a, a certain kind of a, uh, a group of, of voters, and uh, and that is a statement. And she's it's provocative, uh, and it's going to get the uh, unfortunately it's going to get the uh, the discounted. Uh, result, if you will, so that anyone that is pro-Israeli is going to look at her as a great candidate, uh, being groomed for a top uh, position at the White House in uh, in the executive branch. So that's someone that's simply that is being groomed now by the media. She knows what she needs to be doing, and this kind of exercise is perfect and go alongside, you know, uh, the overall political and, and you know communication strategy that she she's adopted. So. I don't see anything there apart from a, you know, a PR stunt, uh, and of course, uh, you know, arguing uh, uh, the, the the credibility, the validity, uh, the seriousness of uh, such a candidate is, uh, you know, must be a priority for the voters. They must understand what they're dealing with, and supporting someone like that, I don't see how this can be considered as a rational. You know, as a as a rational choice, this is hatred. This has nothing to do with supporting Israel. This has to do with allowing and basically promoting bombs that's going to kill civilian women and children. How how do, is she probably a mother? You know, how do you accept that? How can you promote that? I don't understand it. This is, you know, this is you know barbaric. That's what it is. Yeah, it's barbaric. It's the kind of derangement that's crept into uh, the political uh, elite scene in the West, um, whereby pretty much nothing is off limits for these people. I mean, um, they're absolutely in sort of genocidal denial mode at the moment. They're doubling down because nobody wants to take responsibility of everything they've been cheering for for the last uh, seven months or so. And the same in Ukraine, Freddie. And we'll go to Ukraine in a moment. But the same thing in Ukraine. There's no peace negotiations. Negotiations, uh, another 60 F-16s. That's all Zelensky needs, and we're going to win this war. And then, when you get liberals and neocons both basically playing armchair general, uh, we're very close to World War III. It's not a good harbinger. Now back to Gaza, Freddie. The United States spent 320 million. That's what they said they spent, but the real figure is probably closer to half a billion. Uh, building a floating pier in Gaza. And they said, well, this is to bring aid to the Palestinian people. I mean, it looks like the uh, scaffolding for a permanent military presence there on uh, the beachhead uh, in Gaza. Now, uh, a little gust of wind and a little storm, not a big storm, Freddie, not even big enough to surf uh, a decent set. If you're a surfer, if you're into waves, not even that big. And this little Lego project by the Pentagon started to break up and it ended up washing up on the beach it's very embarrassing we've got a clip of this one let's go ahead and roll this this clip this is part of the floating pier that just kind of washed up uh in gaza go ahead and roll this
So uh, my first question, Freddie, is whose idea was that? And do they just have money to burn? I mean, that is one of the biggest failures in terms of, you know, Naval or Army Corps of Engineer projects. That's really going to go down in history. That image is the worst marketing image for the United yeah, States. That, go ahead. That must hurt. I mean, this is a military project, let's put it that way, you know. So this, this is obviously uh, clearly a failure and a failure that could have been avoided. That's probably the most upsetting about these images because if you, you follow the story of these floating piers and the Trident piers, you'll understand that this was not the real concept. This was provided to the U.S. administration uh, as far as providing uh, aid and humanitarian aid to Gaza via maritime corridors from Cyprus. The original plan was done by Fox Bow, an organization you know, whose leadership is made of people that works at a high level in the Ministry of Defense and the CIA. Now these guys are surrounding themselves with a lot of humanitarian kind of experts. And the idea was actually to lease ocean, ocean barges that could basically literally land on uh, the Gaza coastline. So uh, there was absolutely no need for any of that. They could have just provided that. The problem and the mistake they made, Foxbow, is they proposed to bring basically these ocean barges, you know, to the northern part of Gaza, the places where the Israeli allegedly control the entire area. And the last thing that the Israeli wanted is to have these barges landed on the in the uh, on the the northern coast of of the Gaza Strip. That's something that just didn't want it. So they they kind of derailed that idea, and uh, and eventually uh, Fogbo, which is the uh, the um, operational arm of a foundation uh, that exists in Switzerland. International humanitarian assistance, something like on those lines. And uh, Cameron Hume, the, the the directors of this foundation, explained it very clearly as far as the you know what this uh, peer entail uh, and how eventually they might use it. But we know that this peer is only to be there for two months, maybe three at most. And that's what Cameron Hume revealed, that this was not a permanent peer that's going to be there for a next year or two, which will be the, the timing which will be required to provide clear assistance because it's going to take time to rebuild Gaza and the Palestinian people will need help for at least minimum a year, year and a half. So this is a two, three month project. We've seen by the end of August, this thing is gone. And these guys eventually will come with these barges and these ocean barges anyway, and perhaps use what's left if there's anything left of these floating piers. So it's a catastrophe. They face weather conditions already because this was not built off the Gaza coastline. This was built uh, off uh, the Israeli coastline uh, in front of the uh, Ashdod, the city of Ashdod, the harbor of Ashdod. And it was assembled there. And then eventually they decided to move it to Toy uh, upward, uh, uh, southward, sorry, to, uh, towards the Gaza, uh, the Gaza Strip. And I think during that moment, this is when actually the Trident Pier separated from the floating piers and it ended up on the Gaza shoreline. Huge embarrassment for the Biden administration, for sure. Yeah. And uh, not only that, it just kind of begs the question. It exposes the whole farce of, you know, bringing in aid on a big Lego uh, pon pontoon, not to be confused with uh, our analyst here today, pontoon, uh, a Lego pontoon by the Pentagon. Why not bring the aid over the Rafa border crossing by truck? You said before what's required. We know exactly how many trucks are needed per day. They were certainly making that journey, Freddie, before October 7th, uh, and they haven't been since. So this really just the, the, the floating pier escapade just exposes the complete farce of trying to play act uh, delivering aid uh, to Gaza when, in fact, everybody knows the easiest and the best way to do that. And it, everyone knows that Israel is holding that up and has been for all this time because they are laying siege um, to Gaza. Now, let's uh, move on. I know you want to comment on uh, Spain welcoming uh, the Arab uh, foreign delegations, uh, but also Ukraine, Russia, Sweden, Belgium. Just walk us through some of these points in the next couple of minutes, Freddie. 
Yes, of course. So Spain today welcomed an uh, Arab foreign ministers, delegations, a lot of people from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, and other states. And they basically uh, uh, came, I think, on the back of uh, um, the announcement made by Spain, Norway, and Ireland uh, yesterday, uh, which uh, officially recognized the state of Palestine uh, you know, this was part of a, a concerted effort they've been working on for quite some time. They announced it 10 days ago, and yesterday this was officialized. So they, of course, encourage other nations to do the same, to, to join and to come on board and, and to recognize the state of Palestine. I think it's a very strong message. Perhaps this is not something that has direct traction, boots on the ground kind of effect, but uh, I think politically it carries a very, uh, very heavy message. And then uh, we saw that's well, Slovenia as well uh, uh, coming on board in, in a certain way and announcing that they will recognize a Palestinian statehood next month in June. So that is very encouraging. And I think the Saudi Arabian delegations and uh, uh, wanted to uh, the, the, the foreign ministers wanted to to really say that this was the, the right direction. It was supported, uh, supportive of a two state solutions, uh, which he, he deems the only road to uh, a, a, a peace, uh, if you will, uh, solutions. Uh, so, as I say, it was an interesting, I think, page. I think it's important to see Spain strengthening its relationship with the Arab states and, uh, and I think, sending the right message. Uh, I think that's, the, that's what happened. A quick detour, perhaps, Patrick, while I'm at it, with the ICJ, a quick update. Uh, as you know, since the 24th of May 2022, uh, the court ruling asked Israel to stop all offenses in Rafah, and we've done the calculations, and we found that 83 civilians have died in Rafah alone. And then yesterday, uh, the ICG announced that Mexico has invoked uh, Article 63 of the uh, ICJ status. Uh, they filed actually a declaration uh, in support to intervene in the case concerning uh, the uh, application of the convention and the prevention uh, uh, on the genocide uh, on the, the crime for genocide. Uh, in the Gaza Strip, and this is part, of course, of the South African lawsuit against Israel uh, at the ICJ. So it's interesting that another country is now is joining as well uh, and wants to be uh, help building basically uh, more provisional measures. Uh, I know a lot of people will be kind of a f nothing's going to happen. This is other talk. This is more uh, provisional measures, and I think it's really important now to put a lot of pressure on the ICJ to make sure they can enforce and they have to enforce this regulation and this resolution, sorry. Uh, and that's a very crucial. If they cannot do that, then, I mean, we already know they're pretty useless, but at this stage, I would say they, they are completely useless and I think their mandate uh, is not fulfilled. No, absolutely. And it is essential that countries come together if they believe this is the right thing to do, to come together politically. Whether you're going to get an action on that, we don't know. But you're, the first thing you need to do is come together politically, and they're starting to do that. So that yeah. I think that's an encouraging sign. Thank you, Freddie Ponton, independent researcher, journalist. Thank you for walking us through all of these issues today on TNT, Today's News Talk. My pleasure. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen. Again, follow Freddie on X. Twitter, he's got one of the best accounts right now in terms of information. So you want to be following Freddie. Top of the hour news headlines coming up. When we come back, we're going to welcome Jay Dyer onto the stage to talk about the banning of the Orthodox Church in the country of Ukraine by Zelensky. What does it mean? Who's behind it? All this and more. We'll see you in a few.